For life on Earth, there is nothing more important than our star. The sun is what transforms our planet from a lifeless husk in the void to a vibrant world, something that is utterly unlike anything we've ever found in the cosmos. 93 million miles away, the sun leads a gaggle of law followers through space and time, a single solitary beacon that will outlive everything we know and love. But although our lone star is a solitary figure today, it may not have always been so alone in the sky. According to some within the world of astrophysics, the sun may once have had a true companion, another star that would have transformed our solar system into a binary system. What that star would have been like, oh, what would it have meant for Earth, and where it might have gone, well, humans, we don't know for sure, but we've got our suspicions. So today we're going to look for the sun's long lost twin, adrift amongst the stars, and likely never to return. Here on Earth, we know our sun fairly well. It's a burning ball of incredibly hot gas and plasma, sustaining a gargantuan nuclear fusion reaction and occasionally belching out bursts of cosmic radiation that come our way. All of that's pretty standard for a star, and in fact, our star is pretty standard in just about every way except for one. The fact that our sun is not in a binary star system is actually about the most unusual thing about it, except, of course, the life forms on its funny little third planet. According to the Australia Telescope National Facility, some 85 percent of all stars exist in what are called multi-star systems. Most commonly, those stars are part of a binary system, one where two stars are locked together in a mutual orbit around a common center of gravity. Some systems have even got three stars in a triple orbit, and technically systems with four, five, six, or even more stars all in alignment are possible. Nor do those 85 percent of stars account for all the things that stars are in binary systems. In addition to regular stars like our sun, stars can be locked into orbit with a companion neutron star, a companion white dwarf, or even a companion black hole. For our sun to be out on its own, it's profoundly atypical. And the strangeness even goes a step further than that. Most of the stars that aren't in binary systems are a good bit smaller than the sun, whereas at least half of all G-type stars, like our sun, are part of a binary. Those sun-like stars are even born into nebula clusters, making them all the more likely to gravitationally ensnare another star, especially in their early lives. In many ways, multiple star systems are just like our own. They can host planets in stable rotation, usually because those planets will orbit one of the stars while locked into their star's mutual orbit with any stellar companions. Sometimes Sometimes the two or more stars can be thousands of times further from each other than the Earth is from the Sun, and other times they can be very close. In fact, they can be so close that the gravitational force of one of the stars will pull matter off of the other one and consume it. Some stars are even so close that their gaseous outer layers overlap, usually just before they merge into a single star. Some planets in binary systems can loop between both stars in figure eights, while others might orbit a wide outer perimeter that loops around both of them. Still others are only in their system for a limited time until a gravitational asynchronicity between the planet and uh, one of its host stars causes the planet to be flung out into the cosmos. While astrophysicists are still divided on whether life could be possible inside such a system, there are certainly good arguments that planets orbiting just one of their system's stars could host life, and that any planet with a hard outer icy shell and an inner ocean could be the home planet of some alien beings. The idea that the Sun might be part of a binary system is not a new one. That possibility has been thoroughly explored during humanity's search for the source of the gravitational anomaly that explains the strange orbit of many trans-Neptunian objects out in the far reaches of the solar system. While the source of that anomaly has not have been identified, some have speculated that it would be attributed to a binary star, perhaps say a brown dwarf star or another sort of star that would exert gravitational influence but not shine bright enough to be able to be seen from Earth. That assumption, however, has been widely dismissed in recent years as attempts to measure the gravitational pull of that unknown object have pinpointed its size to a planet about six times the size of Earth. Or it could be a tiny black hole. We mean really tiny, about the size of a grapefruit, but that's not terribly likely. The point is, the Sun is not currently a member of a binary or multiple star system, at least so far as we can tell. But according to one scientific study published in 2020 by Dr. R. V. Loeb and Amir Siraj of Harvard University, that might not always have been the case. The study by Loeb and Siraj focused on the Oort cloud, the giant spherical shell of matter that exists in the far fringes of our solar system. It's not actually a shell, of course, but a number of small objects in space that form a thick layer of potentially up to several trillion individual bits of space debris. It can't yet be directly observed using current technology, but astronomers are pretty sure that it's out there and it's thought to be the thing that occasionally spits comets in the direction of Earth. But even if it really is out there as theorized, 
Astronomers have very little concrete evidence of how it got there. The leading assumption is that the Oort cloud might be all the leftover matter that didn't get swept into planets during the long process in which Earth, the other planets, their moons, and other structures like the asteroid belt eventually formed. Then they would have been sort of nudged out of the solar system by the gravitational influence of each successive passing planet, eventually pushing them all the way out to trans-Neptunian space where nothing else could act upon them. But the models that astronomers have used to show how that process might have worked tend to run into a bit of a consistent problem. They don't accurately predict the relationship between the Oort cloud and another belt of trans-Neptunian objects, the scattered disk. In the scattered disk, objects are close enough to Neptune's orbit that Neptune can act on them gravitationally. That is to say, they're significantly closer to the Sun than anything in the Oort cloud could be. Astronomers are fairly confident that we understand how many objects are in the scattered disk as opposed to how many are in the Oort cloud, but models of the early solar system consistently show something different. The ratio of disk to Oort cloud objects is way off. Comets behave in a way that they don't seem to in reality. Basically, it's all just a bit weird. In these models, too little stuff actually remains in the part of the solar system where we're pretty sure in real life the Oort cloud actually is. But introduce a binary star into the models at this early stage of the solar system's development and everything starts to make a whole lot more sense. Binary systems are far better at retaining objects in their gravitational pull than single stars, because each star acts as a sort of herding influence over the other. If we imagine the rotating pattern of a pair of binary stars going slowly around each other, it might not be obvious at first, but try imagining it, not looking at the binary system as a whole, but by using the position of one of the stars as an anchor point. With planets orbiting that star, slowly pushing small objects out toward open space, those objects might keep traveling forever. But if another star, a massive gravitational mass, is lurking out there on the far fringes, it's a different story. Some of these objects would be ensnared by the star's gravity and consumed. Others would travel outward at a time when the star is halfway across the solar system and would move out into the void anyhow. But still others would be nudged by that star's gravity rather than ensnared by it, with their outward velocity dampened, so to speak, and with their direction changed to something more akin to a long, loose orbit around the sun. Still others, on track to be jettisoned out of the solar system, might come into gravitational interaction with a binary star at just the right time to be slingshotted back around, perhaps heading back into the planetary region of the solar system, or perhaps remaining way out there in the void. Over the course of hundreds of millions of years, a binary companion to the Sun could have changed enough orbits of enough trans-Neptune objects to form an Oort cloud. And the models that rest on that assumption tend to look a whole lot more like the Oort cloud that we believe our Sun has. And if such a binary star ever was a companion to our Sun, it would offer explanations to a range of other open questions about the early solar system. For one thing, a binary companion to our Sun might be responsible for our very existence. A star like that, slingshotting icy celestial bodies back in the direction of the Sun, could have delivered the comets that we believe to be responsible for water on Earth, and likely past water on Mars and Venus. It offers an interesting perspective on our solar system's suspected ninth planet, since Loeb and Sirage's models indicated that the presence of a binary accomplice to the Sun makes it more likely that such a large object would end up orbiting far from Earth, especially on an elliptical orbit. It might have, say, started in a somewhat closer orbit to the Sun and then been pulled outward by this other star. It might have been a rogue planet captured and then released at an angle that sent it toward our Sun, or it might even have started in this companion star's orbit before being captured by our own star. It could even have been left behind when this star finally detached itself from our Sun's gravitational pull, only to be slowly, gradually adopted by a star with eight little planets already in tow. Since Loeb and Siraj published their finding, it's been difficult to find the sorts of real-world data points that would substantiate their ultimate claim, but with any luck, the next couple of years of scientific study might either confirm or deny that the binary sun concept has some legs to it. That data will come courtesy of the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, scheduled to first open its great telescopic eye in Chile in January of 2025.
The observatory is going to do a lot, but one of its many tasks will be to map small objects at the far edges of the solar system, probably increasing the number of total catalog objects by orders of magnitude. If the observatory can identify not just a ninth planet, but indicators that Planet 9 was at one point brought or captured into its current orbit, plus a set of similarly captured dwarf planets, then that will indicate that the binary sun interpretation of our solar system might be more valid than that of single star origin. It won't be cold, hard proof by any stretch, but it'll be a very strong sign that somewhere out there in the Milky Way, the sun as an old friend. If such a star did orbit in a binary system with our sun, then there's one ultimate question that we simply can't avoid asking. Where is it? Unfortunately, it's not clear that we will ever know for sure. Depending on how such a star came to leave its gravitational interaction with the sun, it could be anywhere in the Milky Way. Hell, it might not even be in the Milky Way at all, long since jettisoned into intergalactic space like innumerable trillions of stars across the universe. But in order to perhaps narrow down the possibilities of where it could be, it helps to start by asking another question. Why did it leave? Loeb and Siraj suggested one such answer in their study, that it was pulled away by another celestial body nearby. Much like an ex-lover pulled away by the hotter, funnier person next door, such a star might have fallen under the gravitational sway of another star, and probably a one in the same birth cluster where both the Sun and its purported companion star first formed. That would have had to happen billions of years ago. After all, the Sun's birth cluster has long since broken up, with its stars scattered to the celestial wind. But even if the star left closer to the birth of our sun than to now, it would still have been around for plenty long enough to ensure that an abundance of trans-Neptunian objects remained in the orbit of our sun. As for where such a gravitational interaction would have left this companion star, though, there are several possible answers. Perhaps the star whose gravitational influence overwhelmed our suns is still in a binary system with the sun's ex-companion traveling today in an intertwined gravitational pull that's far harder to break. Perhaps our sun's companion star simply doesn't stay loyal for long, getting captured into this new binary system, then pulled off into another, and then perhaps another after that. Perhaps depending on the forces at play in that binary system, the sun's ex-companion eventually spiraled so close to its new friend that it eventually fused. Or perhaps the two stars simply wrenched against each other in a gravitational heave that was strong enough to get this star away from the sun, but not enough to pull it into a new orbit. In that case, depending on its escape trajectory and velocity, it really could be anywhere, floating around a few star systems away or halfway across the galaxy by now, or hurled into a red giant or a black hole or just about anything else. It's a big scary cosmos out there, and to drift without a friend anything might have happened to it. But even despite the incredible range of potential fates that might have befallen the Sun's stellar companion, we here on Earth still have a guess as to which star it may have been. To be more specific, uh, we've actually got four guesses, each proffered by a large team of researchers in a study published in 2018. That study, led by the Armenian astrophysicist Vardan Adabekian, searched the solar system for so-called solar siblings, stars that might have come from the same birth cluster as the Sun. Out of a sample pool of a full 17,000 stars in relatively close vicinity to our Sun, the study narrowed down candidates based on the relative abundance of various heavy elements, that is, elements that are not hydrogen and helium, and their similarity to that of our star. Then, their chemical composition was examined more fully, and then all of those stars whose stellar ages didn't make sense compared to ours were ruled out. At the end, four stars remained, each at least 90 light years away from our sun, but still near enough to share a common progenitor. Whether any of those stars ever shared a common gravitational center with our sun, we won't know for some time. Technology and mathematics aren't quite there yet, and it's an open question just how long an endeavor like that could take. And the real star that once held such a sway over the sun might be another one entirely, adrift so far out in the void that we have little chance of ever positively identifying it. For now, our sun drifts alone, with only its eight or perhaps nine planets for company in the void. But whether or not that's always been the case, we should know with far greater confidence very, very soon.